plumes, hotspots, and volcanoes, and eventually talk about the super volcano at Yellowstone. Um, the problem is that this is a kind of a complicated subject. And so before we get talking about volcanism, we really do have to review a little bit about earth geology, a little bit about plate tectonics, and some geological history of the earth. Um, and that's only so that we can really appreciate what's going on at Yellowstone. Yellowstone is a rather unique place, which I'll talk about later. Um, this is where if we were doing a, a library program, I'd ask how wide is the earth and we'd see how many people remember their basic geology or um, geophysical sciences. But basically the earth is about 8,000 miles wide. And as you may remember from those courses way back when, uh, there is what's called the inner core um, and then the outer core. But both of these are right in the center, obviously. Then you have the mantle and then we have the crust. Here's a better picture to kind of understand what's going on. You have basically about 2,200 miles. Um, this is the radius of, of the, the inner core. So double that to get the total diameter. And then there's the mantle. And then at the very top of the mantle, you have these other areas that I'll talk about very shortly. Now let's talk about plate tectonics. And all of you who are older than probably 65, I could say, raise your hand. And if you don't understand plate tectonics, you don't remember it, it's because it was only taught, or they only began to really talk about it and teach plate tectonics in the very late 60s and early 70s. And so when I did ranger programs, it was fascinating to watch that all the younger generations and the, the teenagers, the 20s and 30 year olds, they all knew all about plate tectonics. On the other hand, you would ask the gray heads to say how many of you understood or learned about plate tectonics and nobody could raise their hand. Um, when I was in college, which was I graduated in 70, the geology professor was one of the leading proponents of plate tectonics. And even then, he would often say, you know, we can talk about what's in your book, but let me explain what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so it wasn't yet an accepted theory. Um, plate tectonics basically is arguing or saying that the inner core, which is very, very hot, um, again, is about 2,200 miles. Then you have this mantle, and the very, very top of the mantle is the asthenosphere and the lithosphere, these two little sections which we're going to talk about um, in the next slide. Essentially, at the very top of the mantle, the asthenosphere doesn't really move. It just sits there. It's kind of plastic. And on top of that, at the very, very top is the lithosphere, which is basically what most of us would think of as the crust. And it's what moves. And so this very, very top part of what we think of as the mantle um, and eventually going into the crust, um, this top part is what's moving. The bottom part doesn't. Why does it move? No one knows for sure. Um, one very popular theory is that the heat of the inner core of the earth creates convection currents, not much like a beaker in a, a science experiment would cause these, these kind of currents, these convection currents. Sarah and I went to a lecture at, at Princeton, um, which was open to alums and, and you know the public. Um, it was a graduate special program on trying to explain all this. And I, I'd have to admit that after about 10 minutes, we realized that we were way over our heads. We understood maybe one out of 10 words of what they were talking about. But they were trying to explain how this whole process of the convection currents in the mantle, you know, hard to believe, is creating some of this um, change. Um, here's, for those who've never seen it, um, there's someone trying to admit here. Should I admit it? Um, here, here, just so you can see, is an is a animation of what this looks like. This is the Earth about 300, 325 million years ago. And over millions of years, things are literally moving around. Um, this is North America, by the way. Um, and just slowly spreading apart. You'll see this ridge here. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, and by the way, this is North America. Those of you who have grown up in the Midwest, you notice this is a crustaceous sea. This is why you have so many limestone deposits throughout the Midwest. Essentially, the land masses of the world were all 
moving around constantly. This is 650 million years ago. And keep in mind that the Earth, we think, is about 4.6 billion years old. So this is only, quote, recent history. Um, this is a picture from the when it was all, a lot of the land masses were together. It's called Pangea. This is about the time of that, that video, by the way. And you can see, again, it's just all together. Then, you know, a few hundred million years later, we have the Jurassic period where the, where the dinosaurs all lived. And sometimes people forget that when the dinosaurs were alive and walking around, this was all joined together, North America, Africa, South America, all the way down to Australia. Um, so it's not like they had to jump across the seas or cross the seas to, to go from one continent to the other. There was just this one big continent and these others over here. 94 um, million years ago, you have the Crustaceous Sea. And by the way, this is a picture of this huge Crustaceous Sea, which was in um, most of the middle America. Um, it, it's again, why you have all these limestone deposits throughout the Midwest. This is 66 million years ago. And this is where the famous um, asteroid they believe landed in 66 million years ago, which created a dust storm, which pretty much killed off all the large mammals of the world. And you can see that at that time, the, the, the major continents weren't that far apart from one another, which is why that dust um, line can be pretty much found throughout the world. Um, in some famous places, the Badlands in, in South Dakota are a good example. You can actually go and see what they call the KT boundary. Um, it's a little layer of black ash that shows you exactly what happened 65 million years ago. Below that level, you have the... the um, the bones of fossils and of, of large dinosaurs, and above it, you have none. Uh, that's why they are pretty much certain that that's what killed them. Here's the modern world. And what's happening is you have these major plates. Um, North American plate is obviously where we are. The Pacific plate is another big one. This Juan de Luca Fuca, Fuca plate is, by the way, the one causing all the disturbances up in our, our Northwest. And we'll see why in a, in a second. These lines are showing how the plates are moving. Right down the, the middle, you can see this, this huge um, line of separation. This is, these plates are literally pulling apart. And as they pull apart, they're pushing the North American plate that way, the Eurasian plate that way. Um, some areas, plates are clashing together. This is the Juan de Luca Fuca plant, uh, plate. It's crashing into our Northwest. There's other areas like the entire Pacific Rim here where you have plates clashing together. And you'll see now how this affects volcanoes in a, in a second. Now we'll talk a little bit just real quickly about geological history. Um, again, if you, we imagine that the Earth is about 4.6 billion years ago, most of what we talk about always is the last one ninth of the world's history. This part here, Precambrian, is right in Precambrian is all of this, um, you know, virtually eight ninths of the, the history of the world. For those of us living in that or have properties up in Sussex County, uh, there's been problems at places like Lake Owasso with cyanobacteria. Some people aren't aware that for the first two billion years of the Earth's history, there probably was no oxygen and therefore no animals or bacteria or anything. Somehow bacteria started to grow and from the cyanobacteria, we got the oxygen that then caused the possibility of life. The Grand Canyon, for those of you who've gone there, one of the remarkable things about the Grand Canyon, it's one of the few places on the earth where you can see this kind of timeline, the rocks representing this entire area. Um, in terms of geologic time, um, again, this is all one ninth of the world's history. The reason Yellowstone is so, so important for a scientist is that they want to see what they can see, what, what formed here first in the conditions. And the conditions at Yellowstone are about the closest we have to what conditions were when life was just starting way back here and back in the cyanobacteria time. And what they do is they study some of the, those life forms at Yellowstone now in the hot springs and the, and the geysers, quite frankly. And then they look for things in 
the universe. And for instance, just recently we've we've had some discussions of water being found um, on the moon. That is a great interest because right away scientists will start looking for bacteria, the possibilities of bacteria that are similar to what we had here. Um, we finally can now get to volcanism and kind of what's going on with volcanoes. Um, and why, why is Yellowstone so very unique and also so very dangerous? Um, essentially, there are three basic types of volcanoes throughout the world. Um, one and two here are the what they call rift or ridge volcanoes. These are caused when plates are separating. And so for instance, right down the entire Atlantic, North Atlantic and South Atlantic, you have a ridge which is separating apart and if you took all the water out, you'd see these huge mountain um, ridges right down the center. Uh, the, the, again, the, the earth is literally those plates are separating there. Uh, there's one small section of the African Rift area where for some reason that plate is actually separating. Um, probably the same thing that happened in Madagascar. It's separated out from Africa uh, several millions of years from now. Probably this section of Africa will be floating off by itself too for some reason, we don't know why. The other type of volcanoes are called stratovolcanoes. Uh, those are the ones most people are familiar with um, and we'll see why very soon. They're the ones you see erupting pretty much around the world in different places, usually always at the juncture of some plates. And perhaps the least familiar are the, what they call the, the, the volcanoes caused by hotspots and plumes, um, which end up having some calderas uh, those are the ones we're going to really end up focusing on. Um, essentially, that's what Yellowstone is all about. So number one, mid-ocean ridge volcanoes and rift volcanoes. Here's a picture. You can see the stark line. These are huge mountains actually under the oceans where there are um, there has been separation. Um, and as a result, molten material has come up from this you know, mantle area and just float out into the ocean and we don't see it, but it's there. Um, essentially imagine, again, those convection currents we saw very early, um, slowly just going up and what it, what it does, it literally pulls the plates apart. And as it pulls the plates apart, it creates kind of a hole or a vacuum and the molten material then seeps up and just keeps building and building as this is being pulled apart. As it's being pulled apart, by the way, um, two things will happen. On the right side here, you can see that, imagine this is an ocean plate and this is a continent. It smashes into this continental plate and something has to happen and it subducts, it goes under. We'll explain that in a second. Or if it crashes with another oceanic plate, it also has to crash and one or the other has to be on the top. And subduction volcanoes are caused when one plate goes under subducts, goes under another plate, and then eventually about 100, 150 miles after it's gone under, that's when you start having the, the, the forces which create the volcanoes. Again, let's talk about those subduction volcanoes. Imagine um, this is an ocean, ocean plate. This is what happens out in the Pacific um, Rim uh, on, the, on, the, on the western side. You have two ocean plates clashing and one eventually has to go under the other, um, usually. Now in New Zealand, by the way, there's some fascinating stuff going on where you have plates which are going all different directions. It's why New Zealand is such an incredibly fascinating place for geologists, but usually one whole plate will slip under the other. And eventually as this, remember this is called the lithosphere, as this material goes down underneath the athenosphere, as it hits down here, it heats up and you start having these volcanoes. These are the volcanoes on the Pacific Rim. The other famous place, which most of us in the United States are much more familiar with, is when the lithosphere plate, that plate, smashes into a continental plate and it goes down under. And again, about 100, 150 miles in, as this goes down, it heats up and it's gonna create volcanoes, which is why in the Northwest, you have that whole string of volcanoes, the Cascade Volcanic Park. Those who have flown there or been out there, um, you've seen these, they're very impressive and they're kind of right on the line. Um, it's because this plate, the Juan de Fuca plate, 
is slowly pushing in this way and the North American plate is kind of heading off this way and they've, they're smashing. And what happens is when an oceanic plate hits a continental plate, the ocean plates always go under because they're, they're basically heavier. Um, we'll talk about that just in a second. When those volcanoes happen, what we often see, and like in the, the Mount St. Helens and other places um, in the Pacific Northwest, you do see this, this big volcano um, and occasionally it does erupt and it's pretty, pretty spectacular. It can, it can be pretty destructive. Under the ground though, what's also going on is, here's the, the volcano we see, but under the ground, you can have um, huge deposits of, of magma that form and, and create other structures that we don't see right away, but we may see thousands or millions of years later. Um, when you have a lot of this magma together, um, it's called a pluton or a batholith or a lacolith. You've heard these phrases before and the only difference is the size. You've also heard stories of dikes. If you go out to the Grand Tetons, um, you might've remembered seeing the dye-based dike in the Mount Moran. Um, you see some of these plutons and batholiths when you go to places like the Half Dome and El Capitan. Um, you see things like, you know, this is a sill that came off and it eventually becomes, becomes a palisades like we have along the Hudson River. What happens is again, this stuff is under the ground, we don't see it, and then thousands or millions of years later, as erosion slowly takes away, strips away all this dirt on top, you end up with these big chunks of, of you know, um, magma that, that solidified and big huge rocks that could just kind of stick out. You know, probably the most amazing one for those who've ever been out by Devil's Tower, you know, you're, you can be driving along an absolute flat area of South Dakota and suddenly boom, you know, there's this thing just sticking out of the ground, huge thing sticking out of the ground. Um, because ocean plates are basaltic, which means they have less silica than granite, um, they also tend to flow very, they have a very low viscosity, which means they flow. And I'm sure you've all seen these pictures of some of the um, volcanoes in Hawaii where they just kind of ooze around. They just, you know, they're, they don't, they're not particularly explosive usually, um, and they just, they just flow. The third type of volcano, which is now focusing slowly but surely on um, what we want to talk about, which is Yellowstone, is the volcanoes caused by plumes and hotspots. Essentially, they don't know what has caused these hotspots or these plumes, but essentially what they are is certain places in the earth where for some reason the heat of the inner core seems to have kind of pushed its way up and created a kind of a short circuit or line right up to the surface of the earth. Sometimes they stay right under the surface, sometimes they're right up to the surface, um, and they just they just stay there. They don't, they don't change, they don't move, even though the plates are moving. Here's one artist's rendition of them. Um, again, this is just a, a rendition. We're not sure exactly how to put them all together, but imagine a very, very hot core that has these spots where occasionally it just seeps up and gets, goes through the mantle and comes to the surface. These red dots um, are, are basically the the, the plumes that we know of, you'll notice that most of them are in the ocean. With And, and some of the ones in the ocean, you know what they are. Um, if I all ask you what you thought that was, you'd probably all raise your hand and say, yeah, that's Hawaii, and it is. Up here we have Iceland. Um, these are plumes that are, are pretty active, and we've seen the result of them for many, many years. What you may notice in the North American plate is this one plume that's kind of unique in that it's one of the only ones actually in the middle of a continent. And that's what makes Yellowstone so unique and also so dangerous. Let's go back to Hawaii. Imagine a plume that is in one place and imagine that oceanic plate, the Pacific North, the Pacific plate moving in a northwesterly direction. As this stays the same, slowly but surely, this is moving this way. So Oahu would be the oldest island, Molokai the next, Maui, that's exactly what's happening. Now you have 
Kauai, the big island. Um, and slowly but surely, the, this plate is moving. Um, and that's why if you look at an overview, this is the, the main Hawaiian island, um, the main, the big island, but these are all the others. And you can see this distinct line um, that as this plate moved this way, the plume stayed still and it created this chain of islands going all, all the way up to Midway. And again, uh, I think you've all seen these kind of shows how they can just kind of ooze out. Um, you can actually visit Hawaii sometimes when this is happening and it's just phenomenal. It's amazing to watch this stuff just kind of oozing out. Um, it's probably 2000 plus degrees and yet it just, it just flows um, kind of like mud. Yellowstone on the other hand, remember is, a, is unique. It's the only hot spot or plume that is under a continent, under a granitic continental plate um, and it's one of the largest concentrations at Yellowstone because of that, of hydrothermal features. In fact, I would say it's not just one of, it's the largest concentration of hydrothermal. New Zealand used to have a, a lot, a lot, not nearly as many as, as Yellowstone, but New Zealand is capturing the heat from those um, underground temperatures um, that created some of their hydrothermal features and capturing it to generate electricity. And as a result, they're, they're bleeding off, you might say, some of the heat. And if you go there, the geysers, the hot springs, everything isn't quite as hot as it used to be because they really are, you know, using a lot of the heat from the, that volcanic activity. Yellowstone doesn't. The, the brand new visitor center at Old Faithful, for instance, is heated, believe it or not, with propane gas that they truck in because they don't wanna use and take away any of the heat because they don't wanna change any of the natural features. This, by the way, um, this circle is the, what they call a caldera. This is what blew off uh, back 640,000 years ago. Uh, those who've been there might recognize, you know, these roads um, and kind of how they go around. This is Old Faithful area. This is the Norris um, area. Yellowstone is unique. It's got, 10,000 of these thermal features. And just for those who, who aren't familiar, um, if you have a very large amount of heat under the earth and a huge amount of water, both of which Yellowstone gets, and the water can go down, get hot, and kind of come up in big, without any restrictions, you have a hot spring. And these, these hot springs at Yellowstone are hot. People do die. People do get very severely burned by falling in them. They look innocent. Um, but every year there's people that get hurt because at the surface, they are almost at the boiling sometimes. Um, and that's when, again, there's no restrictions on the water that has gone down, heated up and can come up and just kind of be there. If the water can go down, but there's not that much water, um, it just turns to steam and that's what a fumarole is. It's just steam coming out. You see these all over the place at Yellowstone too. It's where there's just not as much water seeping through some crack in the rocks to, to create a spring. A mud pot is caused when the water that's seeping up is, is not quite as much, but also when it's particularly acidic and can eat away at the rocks. Down here at um, the Yellowstone area, most of the water, most of the geysers uh, there, for instance, the water is fairly neutral um, and maybe even sometimes a, a shade on the um, base side. Up here at Norris, not too far away, this area has very, very acidic water for some reason. And back in the old days, um, before they put some walkways in there, rangers would have to sometimes replace their shoes two or three times during the season because the acid would slowly eat away at the, the soles of their shoes. Um, this area and then some other areas of, of the park are more prone to mud pots than you have down here. Here, down here at Old Faithful, we did have one famous one, but most of the mud pots are more up here. Um, because of all these thermal features, by the way, it's why Yellowstone was created in 1872. Um, when some of the first explorers came back and reported what they saw there, um, a lot of the people in the East thought some of these people just had been out in the woods too long. They, they just didn't believe what they were saying. And eventually they, they began to think that, well, maybe we should send an expedition out there to check. And that's where you had some famous expeditions with some famous 
people with pictures and paintings that came back and immediately Congress, um, rather surprisingly, within months, passed the legislation to create a, the world's first national park. When we say the world's first national park, this was the first park created in the world, was created not for the king, not for the royal family, it was created for all the people of the country. Um, a rather unique and, and very momentous time. America's best idea, as, as we've all heard. What's happening at Yellowstone is you've got this hot spot, this rising basaltic magma coming up, and it's heating up the granite, which is a little bit lighter in weight, but nevertheless, it, it, it starts turning to molten material, kind of like a hot plastic. Meanwhile, you have this these mountains, which we're going to see in a second why they're there. And water accumulates here. I mean, there's um, phenomenal amounts of water that's, that's dropped on Yellowstone, goes down, gets heated, and you have all those features I, I just described. This is what this hot spot looks like on the very, very top. They can't, they can't picture all of it, but with seismic technology now, they can picture at least the top 500 miles of it about. Um, and again, this is all in um, kilometers, but basically we're talking about 500 miles coming up right under Yellowstone here, but also going stretching out in other parts of the, the West. Here's a more scary picture of what this plume looks like. Um, again, coming up here about 3,500 degrees, back up here it cools down to 2,500. Steel melts at about 2,500. And you'll notice that it touches the surface right about here, right under the surface, these two spots. Um, and those are the hot spots at Yellowstone, which again, you'll see where they are. Going back historically, they think this hot spot did have a big lava flow back 15, 17 million years ago. And that's this entire um, Columbia River Basin kind of area that, that has huge um, basaltic volcanic lava flows under it. But then you have some of these, it's shifted over here, and we have this entire chain of, of areas that um, blew off as huge volcanoes going right up here. Uh, that's why when we used to talk about this at Yellowstone, we kept telling people, you probably shouldn't be buying property long-term investment here because that's where this is headed, um, in this area right over here. Um, this is another picture of it, and you can see this plume um, is very powerful underneath. It literally is splitting this, these mountains apart, kind of smashing this tighter together and splitting it apart. Um, and that's one of the reasons why you have so much water. That as westerly winds blow moist rain and snow, it, it kind of flows in this direction, goes right up this funnel, and then as it goes up in elevation, it just drops as rain or snow. And so that's why it has an unusually huge amount of water that drops in right here at the Yellowstone Caldera. At Yellowstone per se, there are three major eruptions that we talk about, um, explosions. Um, the, the, the oldest one was about 2.1 million years ago and that's created a hole this big. And again, when we talk about calderas, imagine if, if any of you have been to Hawaii or Mount St. Helens, and you can actually kind of look across and see the, the hole of the volcano, let's call it. Um, in contrast, these volcanoes blew off this huge, huge amounts. I mean, literally 50, 60 miles. To give an idea of how much that is, um, if you look out over the horizon at something, normally because of the curvature of the earth, we can see about 26 miles, 30 miles, but not much more. Um, lighthouses on the East Coast, for instance, used to be built about every 50 miles apart so that halfway between um, boats could pick up one as they lost the other. That means some of these calderas, you can't see from one side to the other. That's how big they are. Um, this was a smaller one in 1.3 million years ago. And then the one that you see currently at Yellowstone is this caldera, a big, just a big, you know, the top of the volcano was blown off. And you'll see in a second here how huge the, these were. These are the two hot spots I was talking about, Mallard Lake, which is Old Faithful. Remember that picture with the two little fingers coming up from the hot spot? Well, one of them is right under here. And the other is Sour Creek. Sour Creek is actually 
hotter than this area. It doesn't have the same um, features of the springs and the geysers and everything, but it's hot. And that's why this area, we try to discourage people from going. Um, we, you can't tell people not to go where they want to go throughout most of Yellowstone, but th this is an area that um, there's some nasty stuff back in there. There's some, some springs and hot pots, which are not only very, very hot, but very acidic, um, pretty nasty stuff. So let me just go back. For those who haven't been to Yellowstone or want to get a bearing, this is Old Faithful here. Um, Midway Geyser Basin is here. That's the Grand Prismatic Spring, the real beautiful, beautiful one you see all, so often in pictures with all the different colors. And, and by the way, those colors that you see around springs are determined by different bacteria that grow in different temperature waters. So just by looking at the color of what is around the spring, you can kind of tell what the temperature of the water is and what kind of bacteria is call, causing that color. Um, the, the, as often you'd expect, you know, the, the, the white and, and red ones are, are, you know, can be pretty hot. Uh, bluer ones tend to be a little bit cooler. Um, then you have the Madison campground up here, Morris um, Geyser Basin area, which is again, the pretty nasty one. Um, the most interesting part that, that some people enjoy is the, the, the falls. The, the, this is the Yellowstone River goes down here and the, the falls are probably the, um, the most exciting part of, or beautiful part of the park. Here's a picture to give you an idea of how big these volcanoes are. This is Mount St. Helens, which erupted in 1980. And at the time it blew off in terms of ash and rock and junk about 0.1 cubic miles of dirt and rocks and junk. The big one at Yellowstone was 585 to 600 cubic miles. Um, that was the one 2.1 million years ago. The one, you know, 640, thousand years ago, which again, we're not talking millions now, we're talking just thousands of years, 240 cubic miles versus 0.1 cubic miles. So you can see these are, these volcanoes are blowing off huge amounts of stuff. And what's happening is the, the granite or the, and which turns to rhyolite under, under the heat, it's not, it's not as prone to flowing like the basaltic volcanoes. It just builds up pressure, builds up pressure, builds up pressure. And when they blow, they just, they're huge. When I say huge, 2.1 million years ago, we don't know why it was actually kind of smallish, but this is how much the ash went out from that volcano. Um, the next one, you know, was 1.2 three million years ago, and it's a little bit smaller, but for some reason, 640,000 years ago, um, the Lava Creek ash bed there is called, you can imagine how huge this is. So we're talking about, you know, almost a half of the United States being covered in layers and layers of ash. Um, very, very destructive. Um, 12 million years ago, um, these, these animals were all caught in one of these volcanic um, explosions from the Yellowstone area. Um, basically, they, they die from silicosis. Um, they, they can't breathe. The, the ash is so thick that they breathe it in and it just um, kills, their, kills them almost instantly. Um, this, this is a state park you can visit actually in Nebraska um, to see this. Yellowstone's volcanic activity does continue. Um, there have been Lava flows since 1640, fortune lava flows. Um, the most recent was 17 years ago. And actually from a volcanologist who coincidentally at just small world, she was dating a nephew of mine for a while. And she says that the current thinking is actually that if Yellowstone um, has another major event, it's gonna be a big lava flow, not a big explosion. Um, so that's the good news. Um, these lava flows are huge. They can be up to 20 miles across, 1,000 feet thick, but at least they're lava flows, not, not explosive um, volcanoes. At this time, during um, a typical campfire program at Yellowstone, you know, we've scared people enough that some people are wondering, um, is it going to, what's going to happen tomorrow? You know, should I pack up my family and get out of here? Um, is it going to happen in our lifetimes? Um, or uh, what's going to be the long-term 
you know, prognosis. Quite frankly, they, they, they are watching signals of potential eruptions at Yellowstone constantly. It's, it's probably one of the most watched volcanic areas in the world. They look for earthquake swarms. There's probably one to 3,000 earthquakes a year at Yellowstone. Uh, they're happening every day. And it's because there's the, the, the movement being caused by the plume. And there's also a fault line there. And the combination of this, um, these two actually fault lines and the volcano creates rocks moving and shifting all the time, which is why geysers and springs will change because as the rocks underneath get cracked and changed and moved by earthquakes, where water goes will change. And so one year, you'll have a very active hot spring or geyser sometimes, and then there'll be a little bit of an earthquake or a big earthquake and suddenly it'll disappear and it'll show up somewhere else. Ground deformation in the same area, they're, they're watching for ground deformation. We'll talk about that in a second. Increased gas emissions, um, they actually, you know, check the gas emissions to see what's there. Um, they analyze the chemistry of them and, and, and try to see if there's any kind of sudden change. Steam explosions um, and, and changes in the hydrothermal systems, which basically is, again, for instance, watching and tracing um, geysers that we know about, like Old Faithful. Old Faithful has changed. When I first visited um, Old Faithful in 72, the eruptions were much more regular, about every hour on the hour. Um, now they're, they can range between 40, 50 minutes and, you know, 90 minutes. They, there's, a, there's a way we calculate and predict that, but um, still they change. Earthquake monitors, each of these red dots is an earthquake monitor, seismograph stations. You can see how many are in the park itself. They're constantly watching um, for activity and not just watching, um, recording one to 3,000 earthquakes a year. And by the way, you can go to this website and you can just see all this stuff. It's all public information. GPS. The reason they use GPS is they want to watch um, ground deformation, it's called, and changes in the, in the elevations and movement in the ground. This is relatively new, like in the last 20 years, um, maybe 30 years now. Um, a, a scientist one day was vacationing at Yellowstone, and with his family, he noticed that one side of the Yellowstone Lake um, was flooding and the other side wasn't. And it didn't take a rocket scientist to realize there's something wrong with this picture because it should all be flooding together the same way, not one side. And they, they actually began measuring then and realized that one side of the lake had risen up um, and the other side hadn't. So it was flooding on the, on the inlet side actually. And since then, they've been doing a lot of careful monitoring. Uh, there was a, a BBC documentary about Yellowstone written shortly after they came across this um, discovery. And if you watch that documentary, you'd never come close to Yellowstone because it gave you the impression that the earth had, had changed so much in elevation on one side that it was obviously ready to blow. Um, since then, it actually has gone down. It does move around. Um, and it's something that they, they do watch very carefully. Here is the, the boundaries of Yellowstone right there. That's the box I was telling some people earlier that um, we tell people we can't answer questions outside the box. And you'll notice, notice this location and this location, okay? Um, this is what these GPS monitors are like. It's a, a piece of equipment like that that works on a solar cell and works all year round. And from this location, P721, you can see that there's almost no ground deformation. It's, it's pretty constant. This is measuring you know, height um, up and down and east-west, north-south you know, migration. Here's one from a little closer to the, some of the hot spots. This is like the Sour Creek area that I mentioned earlier. And you can see the, this is millimeters, by the way, not feet, so we don't have to get too worried. But you can see here, um, the elevation did have a rather significant 30 millimeter you know, change um, in this direction. This is another 30 millimeter. Um, these are rather significant changes. Um, these are steam explosions. You can see uh, this is Biscuit Basin there um, in 2009, um, a huge explosion of, uh, of just happened and then it stopped. Um, and, but they, they note that kind of stuff. It's something which something unusual happens, they watch it. Steamboat geyser, some of you might've noticed that it has been um, blowing away. 
ironically, sadly, whatever you want to call it, the year my, my wife and I were rangers there, nothing happened. I mean, just nothing happened. Um, on the other hand, the year last year or two years ago it was 25 eruptions. And these are huge eruptions. When steep boat goes off, um, it's like, you know, 50% higher than Old Faithful. Um, so they're, they're massive eruptions. But these are geysers. Geysers are caused for a variety of reasons. But basically, imagine a, a, um, a tube with a hot uh, pool of water underneath it. And as the water tries to go up this tube, two things start happening. Is sometimes the water column, um, that the height of the water in that tube will actually be enough to be like a plug and it will hold the, um, the pressure down. And then eventually it builds up and builds up and builds up and it blows out. Once it blows out, it releases all that pressure. You have a big geyser and then it all blows out and then it starts over again. At first steam just comes out and eventually water you know, slowly goes up um, and starts going up. And as it goes up, it builds up pressure again. It, it, this, uh, the old physics of a water column, you know, uh, imagine, you know, the, the pressure of one foot of water in a, in a tube versus two feet versus three feet. As you go higher and higher, it gets heavier and heavier. So that's one thing that happens. And also you have often constrictions um, at the top, which kind of also holds back things. So that, that's what geysers are. Um, and they're, some of them are very re regular. Old Faithful is not the, the biggest or the best, but it's the most regular. That's why it's so famous. It is spectacular. Um, I'd have to say that um, it, it's kind of a thrill to be someplace where um, 10, 12, 13 times a day, uh, you get to watch Old Faithful, you know, blast off. I mean, it's, it's really quite spectacular. It sounds neat. It looks neat. Um, it's just very impressive. So the question is, will it happen tomorrow? Probably no. Um, will something happen in a lifetime? Scientists estimate that the chance of it erupting is 0.00014% chance. Um, I, as I sometimes tell people, you know, it's, it's like trying to win the lottery. The, the good news is, is that um, it's unlikely to happen. The bad news is some people do win the lottery. And, you know, at some point, probably there will be something big and dramatic out there, but it's not going to be, from what we can tell of all the metering and measuring we're doing, it's not going to be soon. And in terms of long range, we just don't know. Um, one of the, the, the neatest jobs at the park was one ranger wakes up at six o'clock in the morning, goes out and checks some temperature sensors at Grand Geyser, um, Castle Geyser, um, and they from those measurements, you can you can predict when those geysers are going to go um, off again within a certain range of time. At that time, you also get to see how much steam is actually going up all the time. Um, it is just amazing. Um, and early in the morning, when almost no one's there and it's nice and cool, that's when the heat, as it comes out of the earth, all these little spots all over the place. Um, it just turns to steam and it's, you get visions like this, um, which are just quite spectacular. Um, it is very powerful. It's not something we can stop. We can't stop it any more than we can um, stop asteroids from maybe hitting the earth at some point. Um, and so in some ways it, it, it can be scary uh, knowing that when you're visiting there, for instance, that you're sitting on this, this extremely powerful uh, volcano that just, it's just there. I mean, it's, it's not, it's not like volcanoes in Hawaii where it's there and sometimes you can actually see them, but when they erupt, they're not too dramatic. I mean, they're dramatic, but they're, they're not that destructive. It's all scary knowing that you're there, but you can't change it. Um, and there's so much you, you can enjoy there. Um, and that's why I often tell people that in spite of the fact that it's a little scary, um, I think the important thing is to, to not focus on what we can't change. Um, this is old Reinhold Niebuhr's prayer. Um, change the things we can and know the difference between the one and the other. Um, we can't change Yellowstone from erupting, um, but you know, we just have to live with it. And, and let's face it, if it erupts like it did 600 years ago, it's not going to be the people visiting the park that's going to be hurt. It's going to be the entire, you know, central Midwest and the, the breadbasket of America. Um, and instead of worrying about when it will erupt, uh, we really should just focus on how we spend our time. Uh, and that's what people at Yellowstone are doing. They're, they're, they're having a good time with their families 
and it's kind of fun to be there and, and help them enjoy the park. Um, and, you know, we try to say people should just enjoy their families and the people they love and the world around them. And Yellowstone, like all our national parks and state parks, just provides so many opportunities for that. Um, you know, and I, I keep saying we, we just shouldn't worry about what we can't change, but try to focus more on what we can do, you know, looking around the world. Um, this is Milford Sound, by the way. I, I kind of cheated on that. That uh, My wife and I were there uh, for a few, few weeks camping. But this is down in New Zealand. The rest of these, some of you might recognize this as, as Zion um, or Denali um, and, and, and Bryce. Um, but these are just, you know, visions of what some of our national parks around the world and, and this country are like. Um, Yellowstone, as you know, is just an amazing place. It has such variety. I mean, it, it is so big, in fact, that there are seven different ranger, you might say, sections and all of us work almost like it's a separate park. Um, fortunately, we were we were in the Old Faithful Park, which includes the Old Faithful, um, those geysers, uh, the Midway Geyser Basin, which includes, this is Grand Prismatic Stream. Um, and again, you can tell that the temperatures I was describing you know, this is the hottest part. The blue is always the very, very hottest. And as it goes out, it goes from blue to green, you know, then it works its way out. And eventually you get down here where it's pretty cool. Um, you know, anyway, um, this is the, the Grand Canyon, the Yellowstone, the, the waterfalls. Um, and of course, as you all know, there's, there's plenty of wildlife out there. Um, and fortunately, unfortunately, you know, you have some controversies about um, all the wildlife, the, the bears in particular, and the and the uh, wolves, but it's it's something that's just it's it's worth seeing. Um, so that's the end. I guess I, I should just say thank you all for being here, and and I guess now's the time to ask if there's any questions. <laughs>